All right, so I think we about ready to start our next project. Uh, next team is an interdisciplinary team. So we have a mining concentration, electrical concentration, and a physics concentration on it. Um, and they're going to tell you about a really cool project that actually I ran across last year and I ended up sponsoring it. So, hey, like. So my name is Kelsey Martin. And Andrew Bertram. <laughs> All right. And so our team name is Light Light Liberia. So the problem at hand is that third world countries like Liberia don't have access to affordable power. Um, another pertinent problem is that they have a lot of excess um, biomass waste in the form of uh, paper, plastic, um, rubber, wood, and just other forms of waste. Um, our solution to this problem is affordable and easy to manufacture um, power generation through biomass gasification. Specifically, we're designing a control system to regulate biomass gasifiers using um, various types of fuel. And then just to share with you guys the severity of the issue, I brought in some statistics. So. In 2011, Liberia had the lowest rate of access to public electricity in the world. Um, Monrovia, which is the capital city, uh, is the only city that has publicly supplied electricity. And out of 210,000 homes, only 1,200 of those are supplied from that grid. Um, the Africa Energy Unit suggests 99.5% of Liberia's energy demand could be met with biomass. So that's really good news. Um, and then just another uh, statistic used to compare. So in the U.S., it's about 12 cents per kilowatt hour um, uh, for power, whereas there in that grid in Monrovia, it's 43 cents. Um, the next most affordable option is uh, kerosene at $1.53 per kilowatt hour. And then from there, it just gets more and more expensive. So what we're proposing would cut those costs severely and actually make power something that's accessible. So um, our product overview, uh, to create a prototype gasifier control system with the end goal of providing simple and affordable power generation in Liberia, kind of reiterating what I already said. Um, our requirements, so uh, we'll be delivering the gasifier control system that will be functional with multiple fuel types. Um, it will cost under $100 to build, um, and then our prototyping cost must be within that $500 budget. Um, the, th or the fourth is that the majority of parts must be available in Liberia. That's a tough one. Need to be um, easy to scavenge or um, just actually available there. Uh, so then our fifth one is um, is our deliverable. So deliver user's guide, safety construction man seeking construction manual as well. This is a photo of us with uh, we've got the gasifier right here, generator and our board is usually up there, but. So this is just kind of a quick overview of our, de our design process that we went through for this project. And so we just kind of defined our requirements at the start, just kind of, okay, what is this project actually gonna look like? What does it look like to control the gasifier? How are we going to do this sort of thing? And so we went into our brainstorming session with several different ideas, like one almost just like trying to figure out how to choke the flow how to control air fuel mixture was another idea. We ended up kind of coming up with the ideas of using multiple sensors, different types of sensors, pressure sensors kind of in the hoses to figure out what we're kind of getting out of the gasifier and what needs to go into the generator and how to adjust that so that the generator runs smoothly. And then we kind of got into our analysis of alternatives and ended up deciding that most of those sensors weren't gonna help us. A lot of them needed to run in very specific temperature ranges or wouldn't work due to the fact that we're stepping from like different size hoses and they'd just be too complicated. So we ended up choosing a design where we're basically just reading the oxygen coming out of the generator. So we're reading kind of the percent O2 coming out of the generator and using that to adjust our throttle angle and so this keeps the generator from either running too rich or too lean. And using that system, it's basically just kind of like an alternator. And so then we went into our critical design review and came up with kind of, okay, what does that look like? Where does that, where do we go from using that sensor to control the system? And 
from our design review ended up building a prototype and then have gone on to test that prototype and compare that to the model that we came up with in our CDR for the control system, kind of the response to the change in fuel type. And then we've been doing testing on that system just to be able to compare the data that we're getting. Now, Kelsey explained why uh, it's a good idea to use a gas pipe system in a place like Liberia, and Andrew talked a little bit about the design, but most of you probably don't yet know what a gasifier is or a gasification reaction. Uh, in simple terms, it's uh, somewhat of an incomplete combustion reaction that uh, produces a syngas that can be then fed into a generator and substituted as fuel. So uh, in the case of our system, we initially will start the generator on gasoline and then uh, flip about and run the generator off of the syngas produced by a gasifier. And biomass, again, is readily available. So it's a really cheap way to run a generator and you can use uh, a gasifier to operate a car or even uh, large-scale power plants. Uh, and for our project, we used uh, wood pellets, plastic, wood, and charcoal as different fuel types, which Kelsey, and rubber, which Kelsey will cover later. Our initial design plan, as Andrew said, called for three different control points and three different sensor inputs. This was very early, and we uh, were wondering which uh, which variables we needed to measure and which ones we needed to control. And after some testing, we narrowed down as Andrew said to simply an O2 sensor, which is commonly found in uh, vehicles. It's the same thing, we just got it from O'Reilly. Uh, and we used a microcontroller and an analog to converter, as well as a servo motor to control our, uh, our system, which uh, we'll show in a video in just a little bit. So some of you may have seen me walking around campus with these fun balloons. Uh, courtesy of Mr. Allen, his idea, we were trying to find a good way to run the fuel from that we were getting out of the gasifier, find a way to contain it. Um, I was in addition to initially do a mass spec analysis that ended up not working out. So I was able to um, do infrared spectroscopy instead, um, which was really helpful so we could actually see what was in it. Couldn't get a good concentration out of it, but it was it was good for comparing. So, what we determined out of this is we had theorized with Dr. Stutz at the beginning that um, incomplete, combusti incomplete combustion was what was at play in making this um, this sin gas that was usable with the generator. Other Some papers had suggested, oh, you need full, full combustion to get it to work, to get the right fuel. Um, we thought that the lower temperatures where incomplete combustion was happening would be the best range. And we ended up finding that was, that was true. Um, we also ruled out rubber as a good fuel source. Um, I'll show you on the next slide. Um, and then just for your reference, uh, differences between complete and incomplete combustion hydrocarbons. All right, so initially, this is a thermodynamic model, but I was expecting to happen um, with carbon monoxide versus temperature degrees Celsius. This is kilovolts of carbon monoxide. So we were anticipating that as temperature increased, that the amount of um, volatiles, so carbon monoxide, would decrease, which is because you're getting that combustion reaction instead of incomplete combustion. So CO2 versus carbon monoxide, which is what we wanted, because those volatiles are how we're actually creating the fuel. So these are some images of many I have from the infrared um, spectroscopy I did. This first one is wood. So what you can see, we have CO2 peaks, and then we are getting carbon monoxide in here. Um, some nitrous oxide over here as well. And something interesting that we found out is when you use PVC pipes in your uh, <laughs> gas fire design, you end up with hydrochloric acid every time. So <laughs> that was something that was interesting to know. Um, this up here, where it, uh, you can't actually see water on infrared. So um, this is the region where there are oxygen hydrogen bonds. So that's typically what people say that's probably water, but you can't really rule that as what it is. Um, down here, we got plastic, similar to wood. We are getting some more hydrocarbons in here. Um, again, CO2 and then carbon monoxide as well, and then nitrous oxide. Um, but the rubber, so I don't have it here, I have some of the end case I don't want to see, but we've got peaks all over the place, just zigzagging everywhere, a lot of stuff going on in there, and it ended up gunking up the generator, and we were able to show, oh yeah, well, that doesn't look so good. Um, but yeah, so that's what we ended up finding out about the fuels, which helped Andrew to um, create a model for the system, which he's going to talk about next. So 
the system model and the response. The biggest issue is with this system, we're trying to determine like, do we want to do a full PID control? Is that going to be necessary? Is that going to be efficient? And we ended up kind of deciding that just a proportional control for the system would be the best. And Dr. Stutz was concerned about making the generator go unstable with the system. So due to that, we, or I ended up basically calculating kind of the response of the generator. So running the generator at full speed and then powering it down, you're able to kind of get a time response for that for the generator, figure out the tau of the generator, and then figure out kind of your system response, and then put that into a feedback loop to see if putting our proportional control system on that system would cause it to go unstable and it turns out that they're not a coupled system so that basically anything we do with our control valve you can sit there and kind of flip it around as much as you want it's never going to make the generator go like faster than it would before you put the control system on so there's no harmonic issues because we were able to model it as a first order system which will never go unstable and then here is a block diagram of kind of what we predicted our system to be. So we have our reference right here, and the reference line if you see up here is just the solid line. And so for the final project, or for the final product, the O2 sensor ended up reading differently than we originally assumed. Originally we assumed that it would be a percent O2 output, but it outputs a voltage between 0 and 0.9 volts and the range that we were using was from like 0.1 to 0.9 and so for the model I had it set up at 45 is ideal that's like what we decided was ideal for the generator to be running at and that's the ideal kind of saturation point for our O2 sensor and so using that we were able to show that if you start out with zero fuel the system starts out at this angle, so it's sitting at the zero angle, and then as you increase fuel or increase whatever it is, as your fuel density increases, it shows that the angle of the valve is going to close down so that you need less oxygen. So that's what this system model is kind of showing through the whole thing. So you, we have our controller, and then it's controlling the air fuel which is then going into the generator and we're reading from the generator back to change the angle of the controller. So here is our prototype uh, board that's also uh, on this table ahead of the head of me. And we chose to use an MSP430 as our microcontroller due to how cheap they are. You can uh, get the entire launch pad for $9.99 with the motor controller and one of our big project requirements was that it be under $100 for a complete system, so this was a concern. Uh, also shown uh, on the board are uh, the little green breadboard. There is the little green breadboard that contains an op-amp. One of the problems that we ran into that was rather persistent was uh, the O2 sensor wouldn't produce uh, a voltage which the analog to digital converter could recognize, but a uh, fluke or different multimeter could. Uh, and it turned out that the input impedance of the microcontroller was too low to measure the uh, output of the O2 sensor when it was at a lower temperature. So in a lab setting when we were testing the sensor with a blowtorch, it was getting hot enough, uh, it was producing, or that there was enough output power to run both the fluke and the ABC on the board. And uh, when we were actually testing, uh, it just seemed to work some of the time and not all the time. So we added a uh, 741 op amp. Uh, also shown are a uh, servo motor and the PVC pipe is uh, a valve which contains uh, 3D printed uh, butterfly valve. Uh, obviously in Liberia they're not going to have that ready access to 3D printers and we uh, made sure to design this so that it could be created using epoxy and small plastic bits and we're fairly certain that that can be done with enough tolerance uh, that if you have a servo motor and uh, the little metal wire here is just the bike spoke uh, from a broken old bike. And if you have these uh, random junk parts, then you can put the uh, entire controller together as long as you can get a servo and a microcontroller shipped in. And uh, 
is we have two videos. Uh, one simply can, shows the uh, throttle angle for the valve angle with the microcontroller varies between uh, zero, which is all the way closed, and uh, 90 degrees, which is fully open. And then the other video, uh, I guess there's an error, and it just simply shows uh, how open the PVC pipe is. And so, yeah, so kind of the question that we ended up wanting to solve at the beginning was like, okay, is our model accurate? Is what we kind of designed at the beginning what the thing we built did? And we were able to kind of show that our fuel with the thermodynamic model that Kelsey was able to come up with and the IR data that she was able to kind of find, we were able to see that like, yes, we are getting these types of fuel. Yes, we are getting fuel at these temperature ranges. And then as far as the control system response, and we were able to see from just kind of the block diagram from that figure that I showed before that it is responding in this, in not exactly the same way, but a very similar way to when the controller is hooked up running the generator, it does respond based off of the O2 sensor's output to the specific angles of that compared to what our input angle would be. And then we want to do further testing and comparison for different fuel inputs, and that hasn't been completed yet just because we've been having kind of issues getting the gasifier itself to run consistently. And so that's something that we'd like to kind of troubleshoot so that we can see how the system responds if, say we were running the gasifier off of wood and then switched to a plastic fuel, it should increase the, like the fuel density and so that should change the angle. And we haven't been able to really test that yet. And then so our current project status is the prototype system is complete but it's not completely tested and compared to our model. We haven't actually done like a sustained test and recorded data from our throttle angle and compared that to the model and to the response of the model. And for implementing this in Liberia, the issues that it kind of comes down to is shipping things to Liberia would be expensive and that like we're way under our hundred dollar budget except for our shipping costs. So it's kind of, that's our big variable there. Yeah, we had a $500 prototype budget, which we came in under, I believe we were around $300. Uh, and we're still totaling the receipts. And yeah. uh, as far as our complete system, which needs to be under $100, we have uh, roughly, you can see the system cost here. Uh, a lot of parts we're expecting to be scavenged, such as uh, the uh, piping from the gasifier to the generator and from the generator air input into the PVC pipe that you can see with our uh, throttle position on it. Uh, we expect this to be scavenged. We use a radiator hose just from O'Reilly, and we think that, that uh, things like that and uh, the throttle itself and the uh, valve can be uh, created or scavenged from parts uh, available in junkyards. Uh, as far as shipping goes, as Andrew said, uh, Dr. Stutz is traveling to Liberia and he wants to build a system uh, along with Andrew and a few other students uh, now, uh, this summer. And the total cost of shipping a uh, half pound package to Liberia is $100, but uh, that can be reduced by shipping a large number of units and uh, in one box. So a 20 pound box would only cost uh, $300 to send, and that will uh, bring our, as long as we have uh, some scaling, that will bring our cost per unit down below $100. Lovely. And chart, um, we tried to stay on schedule, uh, got kind of tough at the end, uh, just different things we weren't anticipating not to work, but this is, this is everything, so here we are now. Questions? Cassie? Questions? Laughing for questions? <laughs> we have a complete combustion and an incomplete combustion. Yes. Which do you favor? Pardon? Which do you favor? Um, well, the incomplete combustion is better because it gives us more volatile that we can use for fuel, more carbon monoxide as opposed to carbon dioxide um, with complete combustion. So, incomplete 
is giving us better fuels. And I can actually show um, that we are getting more carbon monoxide at lower temperatures as well. Do you have your children burn that? Yeah. Anybody run this inside a closed, unventilated space? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is not a clean burning system. Yeah. The nice thing is, if it's running the gasifier system into the generator, most of the harmful gases are burned up in the generator, and then it just comes out as we hope monoxide. water, carbon dioxide, water. Right? Yeah. 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 That's, that's what I was asking. That, yes. We didn't do any. I didn't do any fuel testing for the exhaust from the generator. Only what was coming out of the gasifier. Yeah. Yes. As far as this system, is this like a in-home implementation? I mean, I already know about all the smoke, right? But I mean, you can add a chimney and stuff like that. I mean, what is the? Is this a backyard type of generator system, or is this like a in-house for me and my? I would my say backyard. Backyard okay. for sure. I would backyard say backyard. Sure. Definitely. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Definitely. Yes. Uh, did you show me the front row pumps? Right. Yeah. generator. Yeah, what's the input? What is the input and what is the output? For the generator, I basically created a transfer function using the tau from just the rundown of it. So it'd be the input and what is the output? It'd be torque and then RPMs. So it'd be this torque, is it a second order system or a first order system? It should be a first order system. They're done or overdone. So. Yeah, it would be overdone. But for simplicity, we just kind of converted everything into a first order system, mostly because there wasn't any data on the generator that we were using. So just for a general system, this is more for like if you want to make one of these control systems for any generator, it's just kind of a guideline for it. What type of filtering is necessary for the syngas before feeding it into an expensive diesel generator? In our community, it needs a filter. We have, uh, <laughs> uh, Dr. Stutz, uh, hooked up to the generator a, like a simple vortex and drop filter. So you end up uh, with a lot of water and uh, hydrocarbons in, like, free soil and water. Uh, they have to drop out, so we're just collecting it in a bucket. Uh, uh, we've, other gasifiers that we've seen have uh, filter more extensively with like fine meshes to trap uh, larger particles and uh, even air filters. And, and we, would we did that. end up having to clean the, or break down the entire generator and uh, clean it out uh, after we burned rubber a few times. And we, might, we may have to do that again if we don't add more filtering, but uh, mostly we focused on building the control system rather than getting the uh, gasifier delivery of fuel to the generator going. Would you expect them to service that filter maybe once a week? reality and feels maybe if, if you have a 
good filter. We hopefully don't want to service the generator once a week. Yeah. One of the things that we were kind of hoping for this system was like you start it up on gas and then switch over to the sin gas or maybe run it in parallel with the sin gas so you kind of have both running into it so it would increase your efficiency. And one of the things with that is we would suggest like maybe run it for 10 minutes on gas and at the end so it kind of burn and clean everything out. Thank you all very much. Yeah.